Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Lawrence County in Indiana, I had just been discharged from the Marine Corps. I was 21 years old at the time. I have lived in this area of Indiana all my life. I am an avid hunter, an outdoorsman with much experience. I'm a raccoon hunter also and have been hunting at night by myself many times. It was a warm Saturday afternoon in late October. My sister and her boyfriend and his sister and myself went on a picnic at Spring Mill State Park. After the picnic, my sister's boyfriend and her went home. The other girl and myself decided to go out riding around in the country to enjoy the fall leaves. We were heading east of Bedford, Indiana, on a small gravel road near the airport. This road went to a small creek bottom by Leatherwood Creek. There was thick forest on one side of the road and a cornfield on the other, surrounded by thick briars. We had crossed the bridge over Leatherwood Creek and I pulled my 4x4 four four truck off to the side of the road. We were headed east. I was looking down, adjusting the radio, when my companion stated that someone was watching us. I looked up, and to my disbelief, I saw something standing in the middle of the road, about 50 to 60 yards to our front. This thing was at least 6 to 7 feet tall, standing upright, it was covered in long, dark gray and brown hair. I could not see its face. I could feel the hair on the back of my neck standing up. My companion was terrified. I slowly removed an M1 carbine from its case and inserted a magazine. The creature continued to watch us closely. I opened the truck door and stepped out onto the road I began to move slowly towards the creature. As I did, it turned and ran through the briars into the cornfield. I returned to the truck very shaken. I have never seen anything like this. My companion insisted that I take her home, which I did. We never went out again. I have often wondered why I did not fire my weapon at the creature. I guess it looked somewhat human-like and it made no threatening behavior. I have never reported this incident because I figured no one would believe me anyway. It was late afternoon. It was warm and dry and very sunny. The area was a creek bottom with heavy forest on one side and a cornfield on the other side surrounded by thick briars. On to the next one. in Washington County in Indiana. My brother and I were raccoon hunting with three good dogs in the South Boston, Indiana 47167 area. We were avid raccoon hunters at the time because I was laid off from my job. Well, one night during hunting season, we let the dogs out at one of our favorite spots and very soon the dogs hit the trail. They ran across the road the wrong direction to what I wanted, and they ran for about a minute. Then we heard the loudest, most horrible scream that I've ever heard. It lasted maybe 15 seconds. The volume was greater than any human or any bobcat, bear, coyote, fox, or anything that lives in my area. My three good dogs went silent and came running back and my best dog stood between my legs looking in the direction of the noise. I said, Roger, what the heck was that? Roger said he had no idea. I told him to load the gun, which we never carried loaded because of fear of an accident, and he fiddled around until I took it and loaded it myself. Meanwhile, my dogs were bumping into my legs 
and still looking into the woods. Well, we slowly walked backwards to the car, and instead of loading the dogs into the trunk, they jumped into the back seat before I could stop them, whether I wanted to or not. That ended my raccoon hunting for the night. Now, the howls I've heard of Bigfoot online sound like a baby compared to what I heard. The sound I heard had much more volume and force. It was around 9 p.m. and was cool, maybe cold. A few years later, I heard it again while sitting at home reading. At around midnight, I heard the dogs on the porch. They were trying to get in the door. I opened the door to see what was going on, and the same noise was across the highway. The dogs were trying to get into the house. On to the next one. In Monroe County in Indiana, a friend, his brother, and I were fishing along the White River about four miles north of Steinsville in Bean Blossom Township in Monroe County. We had been there many times before. That day, I happened to mention that there was no bird singing or had noticed any game there. After a few minutes, my buddy said that he hasn't seen any either. He did say he had a feeling of being watched, and his brother had said the same thing. After a while of looking around while we fished, I looked up on this tall ridge behind us, about 50 to 75 yards. I thought I saw someone watching us. I pointed it to my buddies, and they saw it too. I have lived in the country all my life, hunted day and night. Still, I never felt this way before. We watched each other for a long time. It was moving so carefully, trying to get a better look at us. After 45 minutes or so, we thought it best we leave. So we started back to my truck, and it followed us from a distance, never getting out in the open, but not really trying to hide that well either. We also noticed a faint smell of something dead or so we thought. We made it to my truck and didn't take too much time loading it. After all, we walked about a mile and were ready to leave. We still tell the story today, and not sure what it was, but Bigfoot has been mentioned, not disputed by my buddies or I. I have been back many times later and haven't noticed anything like that again. It was around mid-afternoon on a bright, clear day. The area is hilly, no houses to bother you along the riverside. It was a very wooded and lonely place, not well traveled on foot or ride. When I was in school, the kids that lived in the area once in a while would tell of something strange, like strange noises. They thought they saw monsters, things like that, but not often. On to the next one. In Dearborn County in Indiana, my friend, his younger brother, my younger brother and I were camping about a hundred yards behind my friend's home. It was either July or August. Over a few years, I had spent several nights camping there with my friends. His mother had been our den mother. I was about 13 years old at the time of our encounter. Our camp, which was really only a barren spot in the trees behind the house that sits on top of a hill, whose contours followed a U in the stream that empties into Logan Creek and eventually the Ohio River, about 12 miles downstream. The area is typical of the region, rolling hills and a patchwork of farms and woods. During the day, we were approached by something making a call that was sort of bird-like, and a little screechy chimp-like. The calls came in threes. E, E, we. The call's volume would build to the end. It's sort of hard to describe. As it made this noise, we could also hear it coming up from the creek. As it moved closer, the calls became louder and more frequent. It was such a ridiculous sound that at one point, I remember looking at my brother after a particularly loud, colorful call, and we were both chuckling. The calls made me feel like it was saying, come on, you have to be able to hear me now. 
I don't know why, but that's how I felt. It was obviously trying to get our attention. When my friend's brother said he thought it was a peacock, my friend responded with, uh-huh, as in no. I looked at my friend because he sounded funny, and when I saw his face, he was slack-jawed with a bewildered look on his face. He then said, something's moving around down there, which was sort of a funny thing to say. We were all very aware that something had been moving around for a minute. I had the impression he had just seen something. I suggested we go and see it, and he said, uh-uh, and shook his head slightly from side to side with that funny look on his face. The sound continued for about five minutes or more. I remember being surprised by its persistence. The other two brothers began to argue about going down to see it. The younger kid wanted to see a peacock, and my friend didn't want anything to do with it. It was during their argument that the sounds went away. The sound was not frightening to me. They were loud and intense and came within about 30 to 40 yards, but not at any point seemed to be a threat. That said, I was reluctant to take any initiative on the let's go check this out front. That evening, we had two birds whistle to each other across our camp for what was probably an hour. Not significant in itself, but later that night, when we had gone to bed and with most of us asleep, something else happened. In the morning, my brother took me aside and asked about my friend's dad. He wanted to know how often the father came to check up on the boys camping. I told him that to my knowledge, never. As a matter of fact, in the years that I knew my friend, I'd only met his father once and he had never been out to check on us the times we had camped there. My brother told me someone had walked up to our camp once everyone else was asleep. He was sure it was a big person because they stood at the edge of our camp breathing very heavily. He was hoping it was my friend's father, but was confused as to why he had come up from the creek side of the camp and not the house side. The funny thing is, we never talked about any of it after. My brother and I have talked about it, but he doesn't remember the daytime vocalization so much as the nighttime visitation. It still makes me laugh to think of him lying there, scared stiff. I can't prove and can only speculate what happened that day. I think a Bigfoot approached us because we were some kids screwing around in the woods and not a threat. I think it returned that night to check us out again. I am to this day extremely disappointed we didn't check it out. A year later, my younger brother and two friends saw a hairy man 300 yards behind our home. The hairy man was standing next to the tree and had long hair hanging from its arms. My brother and friend ran for their lives. My brother remained skittish for a long time in the woods after that. It was typical Indiana woods, around a creek drainage, rolling hills, farms, and woods. On to the next one. After our careers teaching in California, we retired to live our dream in Southern Oregon. My wife, Terry, and I had spent the last several years studying everything about our new home, and first on our bucket list was to locate a place to find gold and then file a real gold claim. Filing a claim is relatively easy, as long as you can show proof of some gold and the particular spot of ground is unclaimed. We pictured the perfect retirement, earning extra money on our own claim. Since childhood, I had often daydreamed about this scenario. I've always been so fascinated with the gold rush of 1849. So, here we were, all settled in and having researched, bought supplies, GPS unit, maps, and having spent hours talking with old timers in the area, we headed to our chosen site near the Little Chetco River in the mountains east of our home in Brookings, Oregon. We wanted to find a place not too far away, 
though we could spend time on our new hobby, we had been following the ongoing fight between the state of Oregon and the Federal Bureau of Land Management against a gold miner named David Rutan, who legally owns a gold mine named Emily Camp. We were warned that the BLM would not make our dream easy, but we were determined. Our thought was that if there was a successful mining operation nearby, that as long as we put plenty of space between our claim and their legal boundaries, that we could find another mountain stream to enjoy our small recreational claim at our leisure. Our quest was not to get rich. It was the thrill of actually finding gold on our own claim. Once we had purchased a four-wheel drive to get us through what these gold miners called roads, we proceeded to try to locate a way to go close to Mr. Rutan's mining operation and then turn off on another road, but to no avail. The entire area had burned in the huge biscuit fire and any previously used logging roads had been blocked by huge burned trees and the economics of profitably salvaging the timber had been repeatedly blocked by the government's attitude against any further use of the public land. So, there were no roads to aid us to follow our dreams. Some of the forests in areas around the Chetco area were not touched, and therefore we figured we could at least get close, but the BLM beat us to it and closed off all the roads. The forests were a massive wasteland of monstrous burned and rotting trees crisscrossed on top of each other. In much of the mountains, the only larger animals that could even climb through the devastation were cougars and bobcats, and the deer stayed in the area the fire skipped over. It may seem rather naive to have spent so much planning, and now here we were. No sooner had we started than we had seemingly been thwarted by Mother Nature. We had planned our entire venture right down to dipping a gold pan into the water and picking out nuggets. Now we were facing insurmountable odds against even finding a piece of this mountain to file a claim on. The main road to Emily Camp was blocked and locked with enough keep out signs that we never got close. We had not anticipated that the roads shown on the forestry maps would be impassable, so we set out exploring for a spot where we could make it through. We went home to recalibrate, and our research showed it may be possible to approach the area from the top down. So we drove around to the town of Selma, Oregon, and followed the Illinois River on the other side of the mountain until we were able to cross the river and climb the winding dirt roads up into the beautiful, unburdened green forest until we reached the trailhead that we had used previously and day height to the absolutely stunning Babyfoot Lake. Passing the trailhead, we followed the 4x4 road until it became little more than a deeply rutted trail. At that point, our maps and GPS directions indicated that we were at a location roughly on top of the mountain above Emily Camp and close to the birthplace of the little Chetco River. With our packs heavily laden and our belts carrying all sorts of gear, including the revolvers, we were each packing, even though we did not anticipate any danger. It sure adds a huge degree of comfort. Hiking down a steep mountain was certainly a great deal more difficult than we had ever imagined, and we spent a solid two days fighting our way down through some pretty rough terrain. We would sleep until the first glow of dawn and then push on. On the third day, suddenly, without warning, we emerged onto the remnants of an ancient poorly graded but obvious road. Then, within 100 feet was a cabin, a very old but intact cabin. 
it was obviously abandoned, the glass still unbroken, in the window, and the door unlocked. Funny how long things last when kept away from humans. We shouted out a greeting, but were met only with the mocking call of a nearby raven and the ever-constant mountain wind. Since this cabin had not been in the fire's path, we wondered what happened to its owner. We found clean dishes stacked neatly in the cupboards, flatware in the drawers, and remnants of tattered wallpaper, lonely but still awaiting its owner's return. Outside was what we thought was one lone cylinder gasoline motor and an ingenious system where the water could be heated by the water pipe that stretched through the outdoor wood stove to heat the water that was then channeled into a water tank that supplied the tiled shower stall. Someone had just left and never returned, and this lonely cabin sat watching the small saplings growing in the road where their vehicles would never return. It was sad. We wished the house could talk, because someone had obviously lived here for a long time, and it showed a great deal of love and care. Heading out, we began following the traces of the road as it wound slightly down and around to our left when, out of the pines, a huge piece of log came sailing out of nowhere and smashed into pieces against a pine tree I was walking by, sending pieces in all directions. Terry screamed, and I drew my handgun from its holster and fired a shot into the dirt bank across the road. It had the desired effect as we could hear footsteps quickly receding into the brush. After regaining our composure, we continued down the faintly visible road until it disappeared completely. Off to our right, we saw another road, only this time it was a single track where we could barely walk side by side. Then, surprisingly, there were signs of a path being well used and there were fresh cuts where saplings were broken or cut off. We traveled at a slight angle upward, and another hundred feet led to an area where someone had built a rock and log bridge that enabled us to cross over the stream. Directly ahead was a large, oblong pond, and at the other side, a narrow waterfall was cascading about forty feet off a tall gray cliff. According to our GPS unit, we were less than two miles from the outer edge of the Emily Camp boundary, which meant we could most likely file a claim on this place if we were able to find a trace of gold. Someone had obviously been mining here long ago, as even the few cans we found were old and rusted, and new growth saplings dotted the area. We decided to go a bit further as we curved around the cliff another 50 feet and there before us was a tunnel. It had been completely hidden and here in a wide area were old discarded barrels, timbers, boards, and trash, and the trash and tin cans familiar to the old miners. At least those we had visited in California and Nevada on various vacations. The tunnel showed signs of having once been boarded up, but over time the boards had fallen or had been pulled aside by people or animals seeking shelter. The animal idea made the most sense because neither of us could envision anyone hiking through this rugged country for recreation. Had we had good reason, this terrain would be the last place to enter. We dug into our pack for our fluorescent camp lanterns because they show such a lot of light and leaving our packs at the entrance, we carefully entered the mine. By using both of our lights, we could see quite far ahead and the tunnel began to curve slowly. So, from our limited knowledge, we made the assumption that they had been following a vein of gold. 
This was quite common, as a golden streak may have kept going and could be the only sign of gold in the whole rock wall. We knew from our research that miners followed the gold vein and they only stopped when it did. We had gone another few feet when we heard a sound ahead of us that sounded like a grunt or maybe a sort of growl. And then in the next instant, we heard a ferocious snarl coming from the darkness. And then a rock came careening off the wall and smacked me right in the ribs. I dropped to my knees in pain and Terry grabbed onto my arm just as two large animals pushed by us. We spun around to defend ourselves, but they kept going on a dead run as we knelt in stunned silence watching these huge creatures that looked like humans with very long legs. They were covered with brown fur and had huge feet. They ran around the curve and then nothing, not a sound. The only lingering evidence of their passing were some of the very large footprints and a musty, skunk-like odor that was quite foul. However, as we discussed, after this encounter... They probably had the same thought about us. After three days of not showering, we both saw them plainly. And since that experience and meeting many of our new townsfolk, we have learned that these were the Sasquatch that our research had referred to as reclusive but possibly dangerous humanoids that had been acknowledged in early journals of gold miners going back to the California gold rush. And when the California gold fields were filled up, the gold-hungry pack swung north. We returned by the GPS, doing some of the longest and most difficult climbing and falling down that either of us had ever experienced. And by the time this adventure was over, we were absolutely exhausted. When we finally arrived back at our truck, we were convinced that even if we had filed a gold claim, on one of the streams we had traveled across and around during our trip. Simply working that hard to get us in and out would be the worst retirement we could ever spend. After listening to so many people in this area tell about their sightings and experiences with the Sasquatch, we're investing in a new pursuit. We should perhaps spend our efforts photographing and studying Bigfoot. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!